Hey, it's Coffee Compiler Club. We're an awfully small group today, so we'll see if we get a good meeting or not. Um, I have one new person, and everyone's being recorded, and we show up on YouTube in a couple hours, and that's the end of that spiel. Um, I know Levo wanted to... Well, here's Matt. Levo wanted to do something. Uh, did you want to talk now, Levo? You want to give it another minute or two, and I'll do a short update. Well, if uh, Patrick wants to introduce himself, I'll let him do that first. Yeah, I was going to let more people, to... more people show up. I mean, Patrick to go, but maybe I'll do Patrick first. Hey, Patrick, like, try okay, to I, I can do. I can go first if uh, people might show. Uh, okay. Go Patrick first. That's fine. Patrick's like, like, like 10 to 30 seconds. Just like, you know, why are you? Okay, on? okay. Um, okay. Hi. Hi. My name is Patrick Ujochku. Um, I'm from Nigeria and I've been programming for um, six to seven years in Java. I am kind of new to um, learning about compilers. No, I've never had to deal um, going there into com compiler um, design at all. So I'm actually enthusiastic about joining this club. I've been a backend engineer for four or five years now. And I love solving algorithm problems. So that, I think that's, that's it. basically it. And that's yeah. good enough. Okay. Um we have a we have a semi-active Discord group as well. Um let me see what else is going on here. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron. Uh yeah, <laughs> Levo, did you wanna did you wanna go? Sure, but I need a screen. Um just a second. Try now. Yeah, it seems to be working. Yeah. Uh, so everyone could uh, see the screen? Yeah, I can. OK. Um, yeah. So um, so uh, I've been working on this IDE. And it turns out that when you have three months of development, and you don't do any bug testing, you get three months worth of th bugs to bugs. fix. Yeah. Uh -huh. And half implemented features that you didn't realize uh, needed more of implementation. <laughs> so um, so uh, you can see if I double click this, uh, it selects the entire word. And that's completely fine until you start moving it. Oh, oh. wait, I must have uh -huh. uh, used the wrong build, or maybe they're overwriting each other. Okay, well, spoilers, I uh, implemented it, but um, let me just, I uh, can't see. Yeah, IDs are a big pile of work, or, or the modern ones, I'm about to say, it. you know, I really enjoyed Turbo Pascal back in the day, and, uh, you know, it was amazing at its time. I, I yeah, wonder I mean, how easy languages were to parse back then. Uh, easier. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and Pascal, okay. Pascal, you could actually parse and compile in a single pass. Yeah, which wow. is what Turbo was, Pascal did. That was my first compiler was Pascal, in part because it was so easy to parse the language. Right. So I implemented a double clicking, which is fine. But the second you move it to another word and it doesn't highlight the entire word, it's uh, it's it's very jarring. And uh, Tri uh, triple click will do the entire line, but right. you know it's still really bad that it's yeah, not. Yeah, you need to let go of the of the drag cursor when after you click. Yeah, you click. Uh, on yeah. By the way, um, what Cameron font is, was, this? Uh, is your this is your crazy font games? I'm looking uh, at line four light theme. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to bring up. Uh, so I, I remember uh, talking about how the monospace fonts wasn't actually monospace, and uh, yeah. some fonts were uh, way too wide or yeah, starts with a negative offset. Two weeks or something. Yeah, so Cameron had the great idea of um, of uh, shrinking the size if um, if oh, it geez. goes over budget. Oh. So what I didn't realize is <laughs> just look look like this. You can see how the H is and E are fine. Yeah. But you know, it's, the T's it's not, not. No, fine. no, no. That, that's very jarring there. Yeah, well, that's because and, you're uh, doing it both vertically and horizontally. If you if you just um, bit blit it uh, uh, horizontally, yeah. 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think the R is also a little bit smaller. And uh, yeah, I, on 12 points, it looks fine, which is what I was using. But the moments I switch it to double size for you guys to see, I noticed it. And I'm like, no, this is, I, I, I got to fix this. So yeah. um, let me just do my uh, currents build. Yeah, I mean, um, but the problem, Levo, fundamentally, is that there is no correct answer for some of these questions. Right. If you uh, want it monospaced, you either take the widest character and use that and take the top highest character and use that as the basis for all characters, which looks awful, or you truncate them, which looks awful, or you shrink them, which looks awful. So which one do you want? Wait, this I, is I grab a, a font that's labeled monospace and they are not actually monospace? Yeah, Correct. why would they be monospaced? Jeez. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, fonts, Cliff. Like you work with processors, which are like logical fonts or anti-logic. Yes. Yeah. I Last tried this one. Fonts was quite some time ago. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Arthur worked with fonts, and he hated it so badly. He's like, "That's it. I'm going to go work on the back end." <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather write a JVM. Go right at you. Yeah. yeah. Well, go in LLVM even. Oh my God, how painful! It must have been scarring to work with fonts. Fine. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna have to figure. I kind of invent my own heuristics because every time I look at <laughs> online, they're they all sound like um like made up anyway. Did, so did I'll just pick a font and then choose the best one for that specific font. So on these monospace fonts, do they come with a an implicit this is how size they're supposed to be but some of the characters aren't that size but this is right. what it's supposed to be yes uh kind of like it seems like it says it's but it's like way too tall and i found like one cliff that was go, even taller than the tallest you can't throw it's, them out at the requested space as the default for each character and then have them go over and under because they want to go into adjacent lines or adjacent characters to fake kerning. They're, they're doing a monospace fake on kerning. I'm, I'm just asking, by the way, I'm not. I'm yeah, not. there was um, there's one glyph that spanned like three lines worth. And I think it was an accident because no other font did that. So. Well, if you got, you know, crazy crap like, I don't know, freaking Windows ancient code blocks or whatever, code pages, yeah. I, I would not worry about it. That's the graphics and the font. Yeah. It so looks, um, yeah. I mean, it looks good at this level until I look at the all caps where it goes crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely going to be fixed. I can show it to you at twelve point fonts, which is what I use ninety nine percent of the time. But uh, I just want to demo one thing uh, before. Um, yeah, okay. I uh, yeah. do that. So you you can see I implemented uh, you know uh, when I double click and then move to another uh, right. Word, You're doing it, still worried the time selection. Yeah. yeah. And it also does it for uh, line if I triple click. So how long do you think just just the double click, not the triple? How long would you think it takes to implement this? <laughs> you know, it all depends yeah. on what other things are going on in your code base. I can't say you know it's fast or it's quick or it's slow because it depends. Yeah. There's way too many variables not talked about here. To do double click, you mean? No, not that. Uh, no, no. I had the double click, I'm just moving it to another character and then yeah, having it the, select the entire he's got the, character. The selection point is jumping word at a time, which, you know, every editor I know of starts with, I hold shift and I'm doing control right or control left or whatever. And I get word at a time growth of the selection region. So it's a common thing. Now, how long yeah, yeah. implement? It depends on your internal editor structures. I don't know. Right. It turned out to be three and a half hours. Yeah, okay. I had no idea. And um, it was uh, this entire so, thing. So the first question is, is that good or bad? Three and a half hours. Exactly. I, I have no idea, but I thought, oh, yeah, I have, uh, you know, double clicking selects the word and I have iterators. I know how to get yeah. to another line. Should be no problem. I did not realize that it was... Um, I think it's 45 lines. Yeah, I'm looking at you're, you're buried in, in iterators and iterator indirections. 36 lines of code. And yeah. this is after it's cleaned up and I have more than right. one statement on a- How big lines. is that function? Uh, this function is quite large. Uh, 512 to, okay, 100 and okay, a little not, bit more. Not terrible, terrible. 
I was yeah, looking but, at some of your indent layers, and I was wondering if it was time to you know do a little. Yeah, function oh, you know should what? never I should... be more than one line of code according okay, to Okay, so stop for a second biggest. here, Levo. Look at like yeah. lines 542 to 545. Uh, 42 to 45, all right? Oh, um, oh, I see you have a multi. No, I can't do it. I was going to say, you could throw a trinary in there. No, you can't. You have more things going on. If style, yeah. if style equals, if you're using this C code, CPP, you don't yeah, have a switch on enums. No, don't worry about it. Yeah. I was thinking there's some some better, nicer way, but it's, I don't know that CPP doesn't, I mean, C++ doesn't have uh, well, switches on I, I could. I could collapse this into a ternary, but uh, this is just how it came out when I wrote it. So yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I have my standard coding style things, which is after I get something pretty close, I'll stop and make another pass to shrink this kind of stuff, yeah. or switch all the switches, the if statements into switches, and all that kind of stuff. And I and I keep yeah. going back and forth on that, just just because it, it makes life a little pretty. And, I don't, I don't know who listens to this or if there's a lot of beginners, but uh, because I have an if statement up here and this is an else, yeah. I, I probably, I'd rather not collapse this into a single no, statement. No, it, it's not. It a... definitely should be an else. But right. uh, you got a you know, three way going there. So I don't know if it's the good yeah. for there. Yeah, to make no sense. Um, and I'll just show you how this uh, typically looks like. Um, what, do you, what do you. I, I just I uh, comment I just changed this. Oh, you so you took the uh, you your font is on the pound of fine yeah. font size on the pound of fine. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, right. And they're all uh, fine. It right looks there. completely fine. Yes. Yeah. You know what? I'm gonna edit this in my text editor. Save it. Do a build and show you ultra dark, which no one will see, and it will make right. no sense except for the people who saw my Discord. Uh, I think you comments. sent a picture. Out. Yeah. <laughs> If I'm in a yeah. dungeon and it's pitch black, I could probably read that fine. Yeah. So that's for when your wife is complaining that the screen is too bright and she's trying to sleep. Not that I would have ever. Right. No, I'm, such a I'm, I'm in the office with su sun facing windows and the sun's coming and going behind clouds. When it comes out, I'm blinded and really bad glare. And when it's back, it's pretty good. And, you know, there's no chance I would make it with ultra dark. <laughs> Well, cool. Ultra dark is specifically because sometimes I just feel like modifying a few lines when it's two a.m. Okay, fair enough. Sounds like a uh, sounds like a use case for you. Yeah, like I, I don't know how many people like to have no lights at all, and, oh, and it, 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 for me, I'm thinking this, I'm not coding at two a.m. I can't stand the lights. Are you kidding me? Yeah, like, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I've seen. I've seen your. We've seen your screen before. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like ever like if I, I i'd like to use firefox but i can't because they don't support dark light as a browser thing so i, I what they have a dark they have well they have various kinds of dark themes and they have a couple of thousand themes the yeah. well i have dark reader on just chrome and like, i have a dark reader on uh, chrome and firefox but i i don't know what dark light is or whatever you're trying to say all right, let's let's have a little bit of like like focus on compilers here and move away from Yes, it. yes, yes. So I got a new challenge for you actually. All right. Um, the challenge is called I don't know what the challenge is called, but I'll just tell what challenge is. So the challenge is to create an executable that displays a welcome window and creates like a shader and like the challenge is how fast can you compile that program? So I'm at for Linux and Windows, both like platforms, I'm at one point. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at 1.7 milliseconds. <laughs> milliseconds, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. What yes. language is this? So, this is a custom Fort like language that's not Fort anymore because, like, I don't use like yeah my stack is like two size i i have a stack that's like you know that i'm caching in registers that's all like so oh, that's, it's that already... like that's implementation that's not nothing to do with fourth or not the fourth yeah, yeah yeah i mean implementation matters a lot because like if you go with infinite stack size or like you know a stack based on memory or maybe you cache a top of register in like in a i mean top of stack in the register um it's it's actually like this like storing both items in registers is a lot faster than going 
with the memory version <laughs> because you generate a lot less instructions and then the registers are also like, you know. Unfun oh, fact. <laughs> VS, code, uh, VS Code takes more than a second to launch an executable. So no matter how fast my compile time is, yeah. I will be very upset with VS Code. Hence why I felt yeah. like doing those that editor uh, a few months back. You know, this gets yeah, into yeah. the... The, the VS Code uh, what's latency the... is not that great, like even for typing. And for launching like a command, it's horrible. Like in my last job, I was using VS Code because like Win doesn't work that well on Windows. And like I, I could just notice like, oh, I'm trying to execute a command and it takes zero point, like almost a second to start executing the command. And I'm like, yeah, this is so bad. <laughs> Versus like, oh, I have also... Um, multi-device like hot loading now because i need to test like the graphics drivers because like it doesn't matter if it only runs on like x64 now amd shader compilers are different than nvidia so i've got a shader that works on amd linux and windows uh nvidia but not on uh, amd windows yeah <laughs> problems like you know All wrong right. like well, we're into shaders now code. <laughs> I mean, that's also like compiler technology, especially a very important technology if you think about like the GPUs are really the future in terms of like, you know, I mean, uh, I wonder what those AI companies are doing because like, um, all right. yeah, maybe I, had, I had people tell here. me that I had people tell me that I should uh, have my language also compiled to GPUs, but I have no idea where I can find GPU specs, the instruction code, any of all that. And I heard they're all pro pro proprietary and that you're supposed to use the drivers to compile. So um, I don't think I can get a win there. So there is this intermediate representation called uh, uh, Spirit V, uh, Spirit 5, like simple portable intermediate representation. Oh, no, you got a link for that? Oh, sure. Um, hold on. I can send the link to the spec PDF or I can just send like... Well, the website, because usually you can get the spec, but you might want other things out of it. Yeah, the, there is the registry, and then it's like, you know, a whole lot of... I'll, I'll send both, like, because the spec yeah. is what matters. Yeah. But so this is the site, and wait, did that go? Oh, okay, that, okay, that went, okay. Ah, uh, there you go, the chat chats. Oh, and Matt threw down something. There you go. Um, Matt, could you copy those into the into the doc, or at least the top level yeah, link? If, and do you remember uh, Thrall's, uh, Thrall's, uh, so. what's his name that used to be on these calls, who um, lives in uh, like our house or something? Oh, uh, link? no, you don't mean the guy doing food dark. Yeah, that's the guy. So okay. that targets that targets CUDA and all those and, and GPU, GPU languages. Things. Yep. Oh yeah, there's so, also I mean, PTX and CUDA that you can target for like. Sorry to interrupt you, Cameron. No, it's fine. Like oh. um, the the Spurry is for OpenCL and Vulkan. Um, for OpenGL and WebGL, you had to. I mean, WebGL and WebGPU, you still had to generate like some form of text. So there is not a single represent. And, oh yeah, and for metal, you also have to target text, even though they compile to an internal OLM bit code. And same for DirectX. Uh, I think DirectX IL is also like a thing. Like uh, all right, all right, all right. Let's let's bring it away from the graphics drivers per se. Generating code for a GPU would be an interesting compiler thing, but uh, generating code for the drivers is interesting, but. Go go get your driver it's link bad. sorted out it's offline. It's kind bad. Of like it, it's a bad situation because like I got this shader that's valid, Spurry, right? Uh, you can validate Spurry uh, bytecode, and it runs on like two platforms on like two different like like on AMD and Nvidia, but won't run on like AMD Windows. Why? Because like you know, there's there's no easy answers to that either. You just get a driver crash if the compiler refuses to like compile your shader, and like um, 
I guess they just tested for like GLSL output then like, you know, so you had to see like what the GLSL like reference compiler outputs and then see like, okay, what can I output um, from that? Like reading that output. Uh, You're trying to figure out why your shader did or did not compile. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I know now because like you just remove remove stuff until you get get you get it to compile and then you see like <laughs> what right, is okay. the issue. But and that then the issue like, is <laughs> like, it's not your it. compiler. That's the shader compiler is having issues. Oh sure, sure. It's not my compiler. It's, but then again, like you have to target like a lot of different backends from the same code, right? You, you need to target like like you can do cross compilation from super read to other targets like people do that or you could generate those targets directly which is even uh, a more direct representation but yeah i mean what we need is graphics the wall prints are like you know a well, saner sounds, sounds, abstraction i think sounds like we the graphics world has things it needs to be doing yet but i think that's been the state of graphics for a while it as seems as know, all you know, gimmicks. You, if like you weren't the, kudo, you were you were having to suck it up. Yeah, they're just it working like, on. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, everything seems to be Nvidia, and I have no idea why I can't get AMD working on my PC on my AMD hardware. But yeah, I, I, it doesn't look like Intel or AMD is doing a good job on getting developer tools. Yeah. It, like, sorry. Years like until they topped out at. Uh, it, it just you know we 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 hit it with the big AI thing and now we're that's our new model and we're leaving the gamers or whatever <laughs> it's not quite what it is but yeah I it mean definitely feels like something's going on there as long as the hard coded libraries work fine on their platforms they don't care if like the generic shader altering people like the graphics developers have like an, I mean they care but like not as much as like their own stuff working in and if if there's an issue they'll just have some they'll just right. send one of their engineers to like all right let's leave. patch the drivers for a particular Onet. shader <laughs> oh let's walk away from let's walk away from shaders for a minute no uh, i, I mean it's for... also compilers right oh. it's it's compilers that's like you know yeah anyway yeah right other, there's something there but that we're but we're complaining and not t discussing what what can be done or what is done or something i could discuss something what else. could be done but like you know i don't have the industry creds so i don't have the street creds in the industry well, I, i'm well. not i'm not hearing you describe what goes on in those compilers or how you would build and you make your own either so i think that's there's issues so let it go i say give the um Give more power to developers, to compiler developers, you know, and then let's Onet. have more compilers Onet. on top of like, you know, let, Onet, let it go. Uh, I got a question for uh, Matt and Arthur. So I was just kind of wondering uh, compiler jobs today, is it just like mostly focusing on uh, like libraries and the runtime? Because I got, I got, have a feeling that it's not too much on the like actual compiler development. Oh, no, there's giant teams at Google and Microsoft. And uh, God, who's the other big one? Uh, you know, IBM's not letting go. They're they're a compiler team. Um, fuck, there's another giant giant team. Who runs who runs Python, folks? But anyhow, I know there's there are large compiler teams floating around the world, and Oracle yeah, still maintains a compiler group. I think oh, in the large mean. Sorry, Arthur first. Yeah, I think in the world of LLVM, uh, there are a lot of. Uh backend jobs uh, because there are a lot of different uh, hardware vendors that have their own chips and they like have a custom backend. That's a very common thing. Uh, but then, yeah, there are some teams that are working on the, uh, um, on the core optimizer and uh, yeah, I think, I think it exists like le less than the backend jobs, but yeah. Cause it sounded like uh, all the out, by the actual way. We are, uh, incidentally, we are still hiring for LVM developers. I do check with the jobs. Cray HP. Okay. Yeah, so I can ask you that question because I'm also looking for a job. Like, you know, apparently I'm unhirable. Take, take, take with, your notes you know, about the hiring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to focus on my ID for a little bit while longer and. Okay. But uh, it seemed to me that optimize, uh, some optimizations that were 
uh, included recently were like all from uh, academia or volunteers. So it just seems like the actual jobs didn't focus on actual optimizations. It's worse. Just, uh, I don't think that many people from academia end up in the industry. Sometimes yeah. the same people. Okay. Yeah, I'm interested. All right. I, I have mean, a short AA a update. Well, sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like I was just gonna say, I think compilation speed is going to be important, especially in the more AI-enabled future, where the AI is trying to write and compile the code a lot of times to see if it works or not. Because yeah, I don't know. You know, in the land of jitting, compiling compile speed was always a, is always a thing because your your runtime and your compile time are added together. Yeah, pe yeah. people care about that. And it, and it like it's uh, trying to run on GPU, right? I mean, it's like we oh, need th that's at separate. some point. So so Onet, you have to break out building an AI model from trying to do something else. The, the building the AI model makes sense on a GPU. Many other things don't necessarily make sense on a GPU. Um, yeah. And so, but you still care deeply about compile time. So I want like to- Maybe it's, it's not even matrix multiplication, you know? Like maybe it's just doing some random crazy stuff from a bunch of data, you know, it, and see what not works. matrix multiplication, like... but neural net modeling. And so it's, it's heavy on the math and- uh, there's some, there's a lot of well-known papers and intros and discussions about what you're doing in that math, but there's a lot of math there. Yeah. And it's not, so it's, it's not matrix multiply, but it is very math heavy. I, I work with some um, semi-chaotic systems where you could get like um, some kind of order from ad hoc rules. Like, I think that's probably what's going on with a lot of these AI models is like, yeah, they, mo right. they model the world through um random connections somehow like and um yeah i don't know i think it could be more directed but i don't know how like but yeah i'm interested in the research well there, there's plenty of room to go looking at that down the road yeah. so let me go look at this here i throw let me throw this code block a tiny oh this is a short update on aa and then i'll go Back doing other things. I want to do more ecstasy. Um, where did my screen share go? Da, yeah, da, 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 da. Say he wants to do more ecstasy. It's true. Um, <laughs> no, I was having this. Is just it's like when I'm on ecstasy and I'm rolling and I'm making great progress. I don't want to break for AA. And then when I'm on, it, it is it is hard to stop once you're on ecstasy. You really you get stop. going and. All right, Mark. And then you miss your AA meetings exactly. Yes. All right, so so let me add some comments to this. This is like a test case. So it's the smallest line of code that would cause grief here. So this is a well-typed function. It's strongly typed. And there's the magical, I'm going to pick the right field um, at, at typing time and make it work. This is, I don't know let's see how, how to write this. This code is ugly on purpose. So here is a, a, a struct with two fields. They have two functions. Then there is an overload. That's the, the dash right there. So what's a, the, the dot underscore is pick a field. That's my overload. Uh, how I do overloads is pick the field. And then apply by as function with argument x. So function is defined this way. Then I apply it twice. Uh, I'm using the I'm using the the whatever functional programming adjacency syntax, but this is actually identical to just calling it with an argument like that. And then I have a tuple here, so I get two results back here. So separately from other things, this is, oh, Google, you didn't help me there. Is that good alignment? How about that? That's a little better alignment. So the bottom two lines say run function, give it a struct with a A equals two or give it a struct with a B equals 3.3. Function means that X takes a couple different kinds of structs. Internally, function says, oh, I make my own struct with a couple of fields with Q in the name, just so I can spot them easily. 
And then I'm going to pick out which struct is appropriate and then uh, uh, apply it. And it's it's dot A or dot B, and I'll pull out either the two or the three dot three. So it's a really trivial function. The trick for me is that it's types. So it's not a type confluence bug for ints and floats. And it picks the correct field based on the dot A or the dot B at that at that dot underscore field. And so I don't know, maybe maybe it's too too simple or too weird, but it it strongly types and then I can emit good code for it as well. And that's my progress on AA and overloads. And everyone's puzzling their heads, I take it, because no one's saying anything. Oh, in chat. That was great. Yeah, dot underscore dot there, Adrian. As a as a as an emote. That that was my reaction to the ecstasy jokes. Sorry. Oh yes, yes. There you go. Uh, ecstasy's fine. I'm I'm enjoying this though. Th this lets me open up all of the the things that I thought I was going to get easily done four or five months ago are now like going to happen. And with that comes all the the useful things you get out of overloads and anything. It just lets me get away with um, what do you want to do here? Oh, not having type class. This is my type class for Haskell or this is my how you do int float widening without having weird things in your type system. There's no special hacks in the type system other than overloads. So progress. That's it. And the idea is ultimately you're going to specialize for ints versus floats and stuff like that. So um, the the non specialized uh, uh, version of function takes a hidden extra argument that represents the 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 correct field to go select because function himself doesn't know what field he should select, but the application site so I'll highlight an application site knows which which field function should select. So the application site passes in the arguments like all call sites do, passes in an extra argument, which is when you get to an overload field, you want this choice. You want QI, not QF. And that I can represent uh, in the most generic way as a table that I have to pass along as an argument. In cases where things get simpler, I can reduce the table to a register and then to a handful of bytes. And when it comes down to you know function, when he when he sees that field load, he has to get the correct offset. And he goes to his table and says, "Give me the offset." And if the table's trivial like it would be here, the, the offset's in the register already. And then he says, "Oh, I have a struct. I have a field offset in the register. Instead of doing add struct base plus eight or struct base plus twelve, I do struct base plus." field offset in a register. So it's a reg plus reg addressing mode instead of a reg plus offset addressing mode. And that's how the most generic implementation goes. The, the specialized version is I look at this table of offsets that I have to pass around. And if it's, unify, uh, if it's uniform in any one call site, then it makes sense to specialize. And then that all those table of offsets just get inlined as offset at each overload load point and and you're correct it would specialize and it would disappear but the overhead of not specializing here is actually really low so that was that was here is here is the here we did this a couple times ago here here is the and are you planning oh. are you planning long term to do the adaptive jit approach where you'd be able to make those decisions deferred or oh yeah in the very long term I, i'll do adaptive jit because yeah um, if n is non zero, because, because you have some experience with the concept, I guess. I, I have some experience in the concept, yeah. Multiply by fact of n minus one. And if n is zero, I'll just do a one. So here's like a trivial factorial. And 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 I this I can run now on my little on my little secti machine. It works fine. So you know I can say fact four and, and it'll print out you know type out or print 24 or whatever factorial is is that correct six times four yeah but i can say fact of like 2.2 .2 and it'll 
go compute for me 2.2 times 1.2 times 1, and you'll get that answer out. But I could define a matrix that had a minus 1 and a multiply and an is 0 test on it and pass it in and get the same answer out. And, you know, it gets a reasonable answer in the most general case, except it has to do a function call for each of the multiply equals zero and minus one operations. And specialized version would turn those into answer floats, which would then boil it down to what you expect out of an integer factorial. So the, the, the goal here is to write Originally, the goal was just to write programs that had insert floats that could be mixed. And then once I got to the typing, I realized it actually it's anybody, any, it can pass in any object who supports an is zero, a minus one, and a multiply. And I can go make, make a factorial like behavior out of it. Um, other than you don't get the inlining of your actual like matrix multiply codes unless I specialize it that way. And then, then the heuristics decide they're gonna inline or not. The ints and floats, I'll, I'll tell you 100%, I'll inline them. That's gonna be a language standard spec that, that will inline. So at some point, I'll, I'll, the language spec says I have to specialize factorial. I mean, specialize factorial on ints. Say the recursion is useless, change my mind. Actually, the recursion is mostly useless, change my mind. <laughs> no, that's not the point here. The point here is to define a, a, an interesting spec with ints and floats. If I were to run the same program in a loop, I would have the same issue. And I can go write that loop, and it would do the same thing and have the same ability to run ints or floats transparently. It's sort of like C++ templates. Um, in a way, except I get strong typing all the way down the line up front, and I don't have to pre-cook up everybody on up front here. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, um, in my language, I sort of type bits, like if something needs to be like polymorphic, I would store those bits in like some range for in, in a 64 bit for if you if you take like an argument and the verb decides, like, okay, depending on those bits, uh, which version I'm going to call, and yeah, something like that. Uh, doing something AA ish for. But yeah, if you have multiple arguments and each of them has like different types, I guess you have to match the type ID for like each. So there's, here's a here's uh, I gotta... version. Of the same. I got an optimization question, but I can. Oh, I can be done here. Okay, so uh, uh, I can't see the screen well because it's my phone, but um, oh. I'm reminded. I'm reminded of um, an optimization C sharp did, because C sharp was able to produce better code than uh, C plus uh, plus. I think the optimization was. Uh, I think it was like a really bad Fibonacci function. And what it did was it inlined uh, one iteration of the loop yeah. or yeah. it did some kind of like partial inlining. Right. Is that common? Because GCC, we didn't do it. And this yeah. was like 10 years ago. Oh, yeah, totally. So, so C2 and, and I mean, compiled right dead, but C2 certainly looked at, at uh, uh, functions and uh, would go, go inline if they were small and hot and fast and whatever. He'd do some inlining and then he'd look again. Did it get too big? Oh, no, inline again. So in case of factorial, you might get three or four or five layers deep. And some really trivial functions, I had a cutoff to say, stop inlining because somebody's just done an infinite loop using inlining. And I'll just inline infinitely because it's always trivial after each inline step. So there's a cutoff and there's a parse performance heuristic, but you do some inlining. Okay. You inline yourself, you do. Fine. So then that effectively turns into you unroll Fibonacci or you unroll factorial three or four times in the inliner instead of unrolling the loop as a loop. But you get the same fact. Uh, Cliff, I got a compiler question, like SSA question for you. Like, what do you think about doing like SSA processing SSA backwards? I've seen some papers about that. I was thinking about a high level well, SSA like representation way you back mean, then before mean, I read. You mean coming out of like SSA form? Something. You say processing backwards. 
You mean can, yes. going from an SSA form to a, a, a form a machine can execute, right? Machine code, including yeah, serializing. Yeah, serializing. SSA. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, for for converting SSA to binary, like you know, yeah. compiling SSA into binary. Right. Uh, okay. So hang on. Processing forwards oh, versus. Now, if you want to hear an answer, you have to like listen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. So I was, so, I was just trying to clarify the question. Just, just okay. Just so SSA is a description of how you you know of an IR. That's not machine code. It has a, a, this obvious way, and certainly C of Nodes version has this obvious way to have things float about even more freely. But that's neither here nor there. There's a serialization algorithm that I use in C two that I've published and uh, called Global Code Motion. Hand in hand, global code motion, global value numbering is the usual things that's, that run together, but it's global code motion. But other people have similar like effects for other related uh, IRs. This is nothing special. And it will flatten you back to basic blocks. Now, if you're an SSA form, you still have fee functions. And now you need a register allocator to reverse the fee functions to registers or memory locations or memory slots or whatever. And yeah, then you yeah, need. Code uh, code selection pass to look at which usually a generic high level mid level IR whatever a, an idealized version of an IR to what the actual hardware instructions are, and then sometime later you usually take the hardware instructions plus the registers you've got and actually encode bits, and then whether you put the bits in a file and you call yourself a compiler or you put the bits in a memory buffer and you run them and you're a JET it, that doesn't matter you you combine instructions and registers and you get an encoding out. So yeah. there is an algorithm to convert sort of various versions of SSA to basic blocks with fee functions, still in SSA form, but now with basic blocks. There's an algorithm generally called register allocation that converts that to, uh, gets rid of the fee functions. Or I, I think asked them, of course, always sorry. trivially, have yeah. them have trivially have identical registers, um, but I like to know that the fee functions were there. And then there's an algorithm that's straightforward to go take ideal instructions and make machine ops. And then once you combine it with the registers, you encode. So there's well-known steps for each of these. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I asked the question wrong, actually. Like I meant, like, what do you think of a, um, I mean, it's been a while since I thought about this. It's just occurred to me of asking that because I haven't actually like compiled an intermediate representation to different architectures because like, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not just. Too right. Don't, don't tell me why. Clear. What's the question? So you're, you're getting yourself to question is, sorry. Uh, the question is, what do you think about the pass, a forward pass and then a backwards pass for doing register allocation? In the forward pass, you can calculate the okay, so lives of the variables so already. On and then on the backward on pass. On that. So yeah, thanks. So 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 you said, hey, I have a register allocation concept I want to talk about. How about a forward and a backwards pass doing something? Okay. So so and then you're going to go down on this pass and that da da da. da. So stop for a second. Okay. Sure. Register allocation is a well studied, well known technology. There have been many many PhDs on how to do good register allocation. All of these topics have been explored extensively by many other people. I don't say you have a good idea or a bad idea. I'm pointing out that almost surely what you're about to talk about has been talked about or looked at and inspected by many other people that you should go read up on and see what somebody else did because these things are out there. This is uh, uh, this is a big deal. C2 did a particular style of register allocation that does not have an ordering for front to back or back to front. It does a graph call. There are many linear scan algorithms and they do something front to back or back to front or both. And I have written plenty of both, including linear scan that go in both directions. Yeah, that's that's what I meant, linear scan. Like yeah, uh, yeah. Re reverse linear scan. Yeah, yeah. So there are linear scan algorithms that go front to back and, and back to front both and combine those results. Um, and compared to like graph, like, you know, doing- yeah. Like very, yeah, very expensive um, register allocation. How do they compare in your experience? The, the usual story for C2 versus C1 
and C2 doing graph coloring and C1 doing linear scan and other changes were different between them as well, was C2's ultimate performance was about 30% faster on an x86. Wow. Um, uh, that's 32 bits or like... It didn't really matter. Nice. It was the same performance at different generations over many, many generations. Also on x64, you mean? like On 32-bit and 64 and 16-bit. And yeah. also uh, on Spark hardware and on Azul TXU hardware and on ARM chips and all kinds of other things. So there was a general, and it varied from platform to platform, and you typically got more like 50% gain on RISC chips and 30% gain on x86 chips. Um, which we attributed to having more registers available and the graph color doing a better job than the linear scan. If, if you look at the large corpus of allocation results over many, many compiles, then generally speaking, graph coloring gets you a substantially better allocation. If you look at a program, you can always tweak the linear scan to tie or beat a graph coloring but they never work well over a large corpus. You know, your second program has to be tweaked and then your third and then your 17th and your 200th and you realize that you've broken the tweaking on the first and the second and the 10th and, and it gets into a game of statistics and the graph color generally wins. So having said that, it's also substantially slower to compile and yet the overall runtime being 30% faster is well worth it compared to the compile speed. So as, as an example, if I have a one millisecond C1 compile and then I run at a certain speed, and if I have a 10 millisecond C2 compile and I run 30% faster, how long do I have to run that program before I win? Well, 30% over 10 millis or one oh, yeah, or something. Really There's some number you do, and it's pretty quick. It's very win. significant. It's, it's, yeah. 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 Nothing, nothing to like. I mean, you could have both algorithms and have like linear scan on iteration and then for. Like release, and you would. Azul has run that mode for a long time. Yes, you, you do a fast, quick compile. You start with an interpreter. You do a fast, quick compile when the interpreter's tired of it, and then you do a heavyweight, slower compile when the you know the the mid tier compile says this has actually been running a while. Let's do it again. Yeah, I was looking for something very simple. Like I yeah. thought about this problem uh, for a long time, like months, to because I want to compile both. To, to x64 and arm64 because it's hard. oh i i would recommend that you implement a linear scan because they're easier to reason about and start with and uh uh if you want to go to something that will generally give you better compiles and you're willing to burn the energy go read up on graph coloring and see what it takes there's lots of literature out there on both and uh, knowing what you write one first in linear scan because it's easy and it's easy to get started. Then go read up on linear scan and you'll find all the cool ideas that other people thought about that you didn't think about. <laughs> but you'll have the terminology in your head and the reason why it's important in your head because you've done an implementation. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's that's actually like really good idea. Like, thanks, thanks for the advice. I mean, the um, the problem that I'm interested in is like if it's even possible to not do linear scan or any register allocation, but still through emulation, like, you know, do custom register allocation and still compile to almost, both x64 and ARM64. Almost um, surely emulation. when you get into any kind of custom register allocation, you're almost surely doing a linear scan. You just haven't called it that. I mean, there's stuff that you can do where, like, interprocedural stuff where you can say, like, okay, you know, this procedure's yeah. uh, register mapping, I just Onet, define go, as... Onet, go implement. And then <laughs> I did it. I, I did it already, but, like, I'm, I'm just asking, like, you know, do you think it's possible to... I mean, yeah, I, I think it's possible, but I haven't tried it yet. Yeah, okay. Anyway. There are I wonder how long it takes to implement because if I knew it took less than a week, I might try it, but I don't know. I'm sure how it would long. be more than three days. Uh, it, um, honestly, Levo, it's not that mm -hmm. far off. You have to have something else already done. You have to have instructions needing register allocation. But a linear scan that you just do stupid shit with and the obvious stupid shit, don't get fancy at all, isn't very big piece of work. And it lends itself to an infinite number of incremental gains. So you do the stupid bad shit and you realize there's something complicated here, but I got something working. And then you look at the code, yeah, I can improve this. You hack this, you hack that, you hack this. And you get a feel 
for what you can and can't get away with and what's hard and what's easy. Um, and you get a lot of easy gains in the beginning on the linear scan, and then and then it begins to top out, and you need a larger corpus to make a difference to tell all this, you know, what you're going to go but do. It's definitely time. it's definitely true looking back that a lot of compilers end up spending an inordinate amount of time doing a fairly poor job at register allocation. Yep. <laughs> and um... <laughs> it is the the largest single ticket item that no one talks about. Hey, so, LLVM does all these middle end compiles with this and that. And I think it was uh, Alan talking about the, uh, Alan introduced the, uh, there's some company out there that does, you know, they basically do exhaustive searches through the space looking. Oh, for right. Middle. They were doing exhaust. Yes. So, so put that at one end of the spectrum and put a fast, you know, linear scan at the other, you know, and, and so basically your goal is to make it as close to as fast as the left end of the spectrum in terms of compilation time and is close to the performance at runtime of the right end of the spectrum. And, you know, there's a, there's a, well, well then you have compiled people time. spent lifetimes on the, on the topic. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we could help with like help the compiler with giving hints in the IR, like, okay, you know, this uh, is actually like, really giving hints at the source code that you pass through the IR. Yes, at the source code. I mean, if it was possible in a language to say, like, you know, I mean, it's I got possible. A question. For sure. This is like yeah, because uh, I feel like it's going to be like you know, how it's... register keyword. You know, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> that's going to lead to a new conversation, but I want to stick to the allocation. Um, yeah. So, the two things is uh, even if I can do it in a week, and I, I have um. Uh, I don't have instructions per se. I have a IR that says like add uh, if in loop. But anyway, even if it takes me a week, uh, I don't know if my register allocation ends up being good. So even if I do the exercise, I don't know if I succeeded. Oh, but no, no, I was no. You do. Thinking if um, if I tell. just look if I just look at the code and think about like if I manually did it, this is how I would do it. That's what if you it do. Matches yeah. up. Is that like success? Yes. I mean, the quality goes to, in one way, it goes to, I did, a, I did timing and it's faster, so it's better. And the other way it's, I don't have a big enough corpus and a, and a good enough setup to do timing games. So I'm just going to eyeball it. And, and usually you, you compile a bunch of shit. You can have a corpus, you compile a bunch of shit. And then you look at something and say, that's kind of surprisingly slow. Why is it so bad? So you grab some random chunk of hot code using whatever profile and you look at it with your eye. And your eye tells you, oh, it's a shitty, uh, you know, it's a shitty register allocation job. Can I do a better job here? Well, maybe I can. And then you go tackle your, your linear scan and say, why did you do a bad job? And you focus in on this one method and maybe got some inlines and blah, blah, blah. And you look at why he made a bad job. So it's, it's eyeball, eyeball always comes into it. Specific loop, hot, hot loop. Yeah, right. So, so the, the first okay. cut linear scan everyone does is says, I march along and I need a register. So I grab the next available. Well, I ran out. So I take something that I haven't used in a while and I toss it to the stack and I spill it right here. And then I go have that register free and allocate and carry on. And then you discover that in that particular model, you end up bad spilling around loops. So then you get loop smart and you do another game where you say, hey, when I come up to a loop, walk it once and look at how many registers I need. Now walk the loop again, including all its nested control flow and nested loops and blah, blah, blah. And it gets kind of complicated, but hey, I need more registers here. So you pre-spill and you post-spill after the loop and things like that. And you get a little better allocation. And, and you know, you, you play the forward and backward game where you say, I, I, while I'm going forwards, I need to register. I want to look backwards and find the register that I need the furthest in the past and I could spill it earlier. And having spilled it earlier, I change my allocation again and whatever. You do all these games, but you but it's always driven by the eyeball in the middle. You're okay. going to look at your code and you're going to decide yourself. It sucks or it doesn't. I actually have a, a test. Um, I have a, I've been slowly building a list of things I want to optimize, like my optimizers should do, but I haven't uh, had any hot loops in there. So I'm, I'm going to keep an eye out on hot loops I want to optimize. Um, yeah, that is, that is sort of the, the, the normal major thing to get right first. And once that's right, you can then worry about spilling in generic hot or cold code or other things, but 
and converting it's things to uh brightness like, uh, and then it's hot loops and then and then you yeah. get fancy real one of the tests is converting things into uh trailing zero accounts but uh, like i'm not 100 sure on how to optimize that one but it's I, you know if if all the world were trailing zero accounts there'd be an answer already but i, I think you'll discover that the time amount of time spent looking for trailing zeros in any given yeah. <laughs> file or whatever is it's not where you get best use of your time. It, it's only my code that uses a lot of uh, trailing zeros. Like, I don't think anyone else does. Yeah, that's fine. And if you're compiling for yourself, then you should optimize for yourself. And that's easy, too. Easy at the high level, not necessarily easy at implementation. I, I generally encourage everyone who's writing a compiler to go write registrar locators at least once. There's such a fertile sea of cool, imaginary, fun things to go do. And, uh, and yeah, they're so key. I've never, to, I've never had to write one. I, I didn't say I could make you. I said I encourage you to. No, no, I'm, I'm just I, I'm kind of surprised I've never had to because back when it, I was doing register stuff, it was by hand doing the assembly. I'm about to say, you did and, assembly at some point. Do you generate assembly or are you a handwriting assembly? Yes. You, you were generating it at some point. Um, well, not from a high level language, no. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, it gets a little more. You come from high level. Ma language. Think, think macro slash template assembly. Gotcha. Now. Yeah, gotcha. But you know, back then, I only had two registers. So there you go. So X and Y on the sixty five. Oh, you're doing a technically five hundred two or something. Yeah, piece of shit. Oh, they, wow. they were cheap. That's why. I you know I first compiled up to Z80, which at least had six registers, and then two. yeah, I had a Z80 in my 6502 machine. I had a Z80 card in my. Uh, oh yeah, were you generating for the the Z80 card? No, uh, no. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I assume had, you played. Uh, I, I was able to run Turbo Pascal on the Z80, which is. Oh, that's wild. I think I. Uh, I assume everyone here played Super Mario Brothers. That was the 6502. So, yeah, Cameron, I, I want you to think about how that was uh, uh, handwritten and optimized. Oh, Super Mario Brothers? 65. Oh, almost surely it was all assembly. I mean, I wrote large programs in assembly back in the day. That's what you did. Yeah. Uh, the other day, I, I saw something about like how they figure out how to increase. Uh, they were using subpixels to increase how fast Mario was running. Yeah. And uh, they talk about the logic about that. And yeah, um, yeah, when you only have like two or three registers, uh, it seems a little hard. Huh? No, you, you sort it out, though. If you live the life, then it, it becomes it's OK. It's what you have. Zero pages are awesome. Page zero. There was something called page zero, which is in 6502, which was essentially acting as almost registers. Right. A yeah. section of memory would access it, faster. It was Right, there was an instruction mode that had a short form addressing that went to page zero. Boy, I've forgotten that. Yeah, two fifty six bytes, right, or something like no, one twenty eight bytes. No, two two fifty six on the NES. Okay, I thought it was two fifty six, but I, I mean, we're talking really old bits in my head here. And the OS might have been grabbing some as well. If you're thinking one twenty. There was a pretty fun talk about this. From Euro LLVM because someone was actually working on backend LLVM backend for 6502 and they had to use those tricks like page zero because otherwise it's a very register starved machine. Yes. To generate That's any code. <laughs> You're hilarious not talking about though, to think about LLVM running on a 6502. So you, you think no. LLVM is slow now? Running no, on a 6502. No, generating for it. Don't run. Oh my God. <laughs> death. Death. Like Maybe history will take like a different turn and we'll all program assembly in the future with a macro language because like we all have to rely on some external compiler who maybe does a better job. We don't know until we like, you know, look at the Arnett. assembly. Most Arnett. don't even look at the assembly. Arnett, so let it go. The thing is, if it doesn't matter, then we could write an assembly. It doesn't have it does to be that efficient, right? I'm not saying like... Oh, no. This argument get... went by in the 60s, and the assembly <laughs> writers lost. Of well, course, we're just going to write a business-oriented language, and ChatGPT is going to transform this to the machine code. Well, then that's your compiler, ChatGPT. Let me know how that works for you. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of tokens. Yes, exactly. Fine. I know, uh, one-eighth of the compiler.
you cut off. Actually, sorry, it's it's funny that that uh, about the conversation about assembly because uh, I think a few CCCs ago, uh, we did Cliff demoed uh, this uh, how how uh, like this DSL works. Um, you can write, yeah, basically. So I've been um, trying to improve my own high level assembler a bit and uh, yeah, basically making it look a bit like this function call style uh, inline assembly, but it's still symbolic. So, like, I mean, yeah, the thing is in these DSLs, like that you see in V8 or Hotspot or whatever, it's usually like the, 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 the block of code that is supposed to, um, I don't know create some block of assembly is actually run right it's like a code yeah. generator yeah um yeah. so yeah so basically all of these functions these inline assembly functions have side effects that like put a bit of binary into a output or something and the thing is that works nice for uh like yeah if you have a bunch of like whatever uh it, it it works it works nice for some cases but i thought it might be interesting if you uh like uh, if we if we just um uh, like at least it's how I'm doing it in my language. Like if I have an if branch or something, then uh, and in there I have some of these instructions. Then this if branch gets actually compiled to a branch in the final assembly. So uh, it's it's basically these functions, um, these inline assembly function calls uh, in my language don't have side effects that produce assembly, but more like they they are actually description of the program. So it's it really is more like a macro assembler, but so uh, one that compiles uh like if uh like control flow and then like uh, certain loops uh mm. yeah so it, it's kind of nice to to write like so basically i can write um like a very normal looking assembly but i can combine it with uh i can combine it with um like automatic register allocation uh, like very basic one uh, but the, and and like um don't have to worry about uh the, I don't know, like dividing my stuff into certain blocks and labeling them and thinking about like where to place my jumps. Uh, like, yeah, things can be a bit more high level, but I kind of get macros and all the features from a macro assembler for free, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and also it kind of like aligns or meshes, meshes really well with this uh, idea of having really good support for compile time function evaluation because... Yeah. Uh, because the, it's really funny. So essentially, uh, like having compile time functions, and uh, like the, these, um, yeah, these inline assembly functions, and defining them as compile time functions allows me to get something like macros, except they're type safe, and uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Like, yeah, uh, currently I I forbid uh, any kind of I, I honestly, I, if, if people are interested, I can show also show a bit of code, like or a bit of uh, some of these Definitely. thoughts in my terminal. I'm very interested. It's it's close to what I'm doing actually. Like I'm interested in how yours works. Yeah. Okay. But it's it's uh, very. Let's say it's cute uh, because I'm not a not a good compiler engineer, so it, it will look a bit pathetic, yeah. and there's <laughs> not much uh, progress. But like, yeah, I can show a bit. Uh, may, maybe in a maybe in a minute or so, uh, or, or in, in, as next topic, maybe someone else can start off some work talking about something and I'll join in a bit later after that. So okay. about like function, compile time functions, you said like, so in my compiler, I, I generate code to generate code to generate code to generate code. So it's like <laughs> um, you run the code that you generate in the compile time or you define them. Yeah, this is... At, this is the whole uh, uh, go. I needed some handwritten assembly to go interface with my other normal compile things. Exactly. And it got yeah. got complicated enough that I wanted some support in handwriting my assembly. And it has to interface with the compile, and the compiler generates code that works from compile to compile, but has some invariants that I might blow in the assembler so I can get the assembler to man handle invariants for me. I can get the assembler to. Uh, do some trivial register allocation for me. I can get the assembler to do, you know, easy name changes or or compile time constants. There, there are a bunch of cool things that come out of that. Yeah, I mean, um, I've never seen it in a language 
before. Like, you know, um, the language that Roy says, executing the just compiled code again. To, we talked you know, about this in, on prior CCCs. I'll throw a code block out while Adrian's getting his thing ready. But if you go look at the source code for Hotspot, and we've dragged that up before here, um, you're writing in C code, so you've got some, you know, int, main, whatever, C code. I'm writing in the doc. Let me share the doc. So, but Adrian, you just kick in whenever because people have seen sure. mine before. Maybe Own It hasn't, but I think I can do it now. Uh... <laughs> well, why don't you go ahead of mine? I'll go wipe mine out and, and you go show your version of the same thing or okay, whatever I mean, I can, it's going to be. I, uh, I can share my screen maybe. Yeah, and then yeah share screen. Copy the stuff in the docs. All right. I made the font a bit bigger so people can see it. And this is a bit spontaneous. So, uh, yeah. You guys can see it? Yeah, screen. I can see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in, in in my language currently, you can define like functions or something. You 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 say like define whatever, and then on the right side you have an expression, takes maybe an argument, and then you can do your stuff here. And for inline assembly, uh, it's has the same form. So th this this function block is an expression here, and this assembly block is also an expression, but it follows different rules. So in here you can't allocate uh, so you can't um, like like uh, declare variables of type that are larger than a register and you need to spill explicitly and other things so yeah uh, and this is like uh, how, like some init code this is like uh, initializes the stack pointer for instance uh, this is like a great entry point for uh, yeah something and, so you're writing um, you're writing hex address there or something as opposed to yeah yeah this is the this is the location of my stack like on a particular oh. machine okay um, fine Right. And uh, so, so I can, on one hand, I can, I can like assign uh, some values to explicit registers and I can, for instance, I don't know, add something to this register. Maybe I add 32 to it. Uh, right. But uh, another thing I can do is also, I can, I don't know, like just create a local variable. And this will like basically do automatic register allocation. And then I, I, put something like in here. Right. And uh, the interesting thing is, so, okay, this, this is kind of funny. Uh, like this here has the type, whatever, U64 or something. And then this uh, a, like add immediate word, uh, whatever, um, yeah. this function. The question is like, what signature is it? Because technically it has no, I mean, it has no side effect or anything. It's not like this code generator. So well, what, what is your high level language you're writing in? Uh, this is my own like kind of. What, what do you mean? Can you? Yeah. Okay. So so you're saying what type uh, is the thing? And I'm I'm trying to figure out: Are you type inferencing because you're Haskell, or are you using C? Yeah. But basic, just basic from top to bottom, like a basic type inference. Uh, but nothing. But oh, top to bottom here. type inference. Yeah. Okay. And the thing is, uh, so I have this distinction between compile time functions and runtime functions, or like yeah. Uh, so so. I could say, for instance, that this add uh, assembly function is something like this. It takes like some kind of argument, like uh, three arguments yeah. of an, in, in a certain type. And the question is, what kind of type? Well, it's and then in, so the C better be an integer. A yeah. And the thing is, like, obviously, yeah, right. It, it has to be a constant. It can't be a runtime non value. So, like, this, this, it just, that it makes no sense to have this be a runtime function. So I basically put it in, in, in like I, I move it to compile time. So what happens is that actually I just put these parameters on the left side of the assignment and, and it becomes basically something like a template. And what I say here is uh, A is the register, uh, B is a register, and C is an immediate. Yeah. And the parameters on my right side uh, and like, I can just say here something like this is built in, so it doesn't have actual code with it. Right, right. Uh, You're gonna emit some bits for that one. Right, and uh, so so yeah, basically um, on the left side, all of these things have to be known at, at the compile time. And uh, so the interesting thing here is when when I look at this assembly block ABC, I mean it's a local variable that I declare, right. uh, and and it's it has a it has runtime semantics, but the register allocation happens at compile time. So the funny thing is, 
uh, there is some coercion I can do here. So even though ABC is technically a runtime value, since I know exactly what register it will be in at, uh, at compile time, it is able to be passed into this uh, function as a gen uh, as a compile time parameter. It just coerces it to this register uh, type. Um, that's kind of something okay. I found very funny. The coercion has to emit an instruction that says move zero into rex or whatever the register is going to be. Uh, well, actually, the 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 the, the uh, emission. The, the emitting of the this like moving it into a register happens already here when I declare oh, okay. the variable. Fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so you have right. two names for ABC. One of them is generically U64. The other one is it's a register and you've picked the register. Right, right. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. So ABC both refers to the value, but also it does, it is actually an alias for a register. Uh, so I can also, um, yeah. Uh, the funny thing is, so I, I can move contents, uh, I can move this stuff, um, for instance, uh, coerced, register, ABC. So it, it, the thing is that this, this is a bit of a subtyping relationship there, but uh, yeah, ABC can be coerced into a, a variable of type register. And uh, the funny thing is this is very safe. This is safe to do because registers can hold any value, but if I want to go back, then that will be not allowed. So um, this is also quite nice to get some type safety when you move values in and out of registers uh, that you don't mix up, uh, like, yeah, because the registers tend to get reused for all kinds of things. Uh, right, so right. And then uh, I, I basically uh, have two I have multiple classes. I, I call them like immediate 20, 12, right. whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that I'm very specific about the bits I use. Right. And the cool thing is also I can say, um, ABC is X, I can I can do this a uh, stack pointer uh, X two and okay right and now you can do something with stack pointer right uh, it, 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 this is a nice thing because this is uh, so I reuse the same machinery that I use like in my normal language I, I didn't even realize this works like together but if I like um, just reuse like let bindings. I actually get an alias, like a name for my uh, like explicit registers. So that's quite nice. So I can now program with uh, names uh, instead of explicit registers, which is nice. Right. Uh, and and I can also define like globals and define yeah. registers globally. And, and that's cool. I don't know for certain things. So yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. Basically, the difference then to the to the this. ESL style was that if I have an if condition here and some kind of predicate, then yes. like uh, yeah, basically the compiler will insert a branch. Yes, right. That was a big yes. deal. It was one of the major things we would do with the assembler and hotspot. Just conditionally emit code. Right. Uh, yes, and the thing is, like in this condition, I'm not exactly sure what uh, how I plan to um, distinguish between if branches that are. That have predicates that oh. are known to be evaluatable at compile time, because I want to use this for conditional compilation to really get rid of uh, like branches. Right, right, um, right. But well, well, right. So, like in Hotspot, a, a thing would be, I have a uh, an oop. I need. I'm doing a storm and oop. I need to do a card mark. Well, the card mark actually depends on which garbage collector the technology is being used. So there'd be an if the GC of the system needs this kind of card mark, else the GC needs that, else it doesn't need a card mark, and you'd get a couple of different variations of card mark code emitted based on the garbage collection. Yeah. Uh, right. An I example would be yeah. like, if, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And in, in this case, I really don't want like uh, this stuff, uh, this config thing, this is a namespace of of anything that is known at compile time in my right. case, like this is part of the build target. And like here, I don't want to have like dead right. code. You don't, don't want to admit or you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's, uh, that's... right. So so it's a bit uh, tricky. I'm not exactly sure how I should uh, like tell um, what I should do in my language to so the user is sure that it will be. Okay, uh... so if I wrote code like this in Hotspot, that yeah. meant no code was emitted or the one or the two instructions were emitted left or right. There was right. a separate thing I did if I wanted to have branches in the code. 
And mm -hmm. I actually wrote that you had a jump instruction. So where you have an add IW, I'd have a jump. Yeah. And I'd have a target label. Right, right. And that you can make sense. those conditional just as anything else. So you would add a label somewhere and you could have a jump somewhere. And the, as long as both the jump and the label appear the same somewhere in the same compilation, whatever, the same invocation of your assembler here, he would sort them out and make them line up. And then he would do the long and short form of the branch and do all those optimization things and blah, blah, blah. But I wrote a branch in. I didn't use an if to emit a branch like a compiler of a high level language takes an if and makes a branch. Right. I a jump instruction. I wanted a jump. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm still. I will be exploring like how, how it feels yeah. to have this this model because it it puts it makes one thing easier and the other thing a bit more confusing possibly. Yeah. So, uh, well, when I was writing assembly, I knew that I wanted certain kinds of instructions, and so I would I would there, there's less guesswork I was letting the compiler get away with. So I, if I wanted a jump, fuck it, I got a jump. Right. Yeah, I still need. Uh, uh, then the other thing is also. Uh, I do need. Ah, uh, by the way. Uh, yeah, nothing. No, I I do have jumps as well. Uh, so if I want to have a main function or something. Uh, yeah, I, I do need a jump. Yeah. yeah. But right. the nice thing is, uh, it feels. By the way, it feels very very nice to have this like this super basic language right now. Um, because uh, all my instructions or like. All the functions everywhere, the physical addresses are known. Uh, so the understanding the assembly and the binary output is quite nice. I don't need to deal with linkers or any binary file formats. Uh, it's right. actually, no, no, it, it's very productive. Yeah. Yes, it's very. It's a huge thing if you have to write a bunch of it because that's what Hotspot needs: uh, several thousands of lines of, of handwritten assembly. It's really helpful. What else was I going to say here? Matt threw out one for Python, and I've shown the one in Hotspot before. I could pull it up. Here's a link to PeachPy doing sort of automatic generation of some kind of, but using Python. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, um, I named my 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 instructions, especially on x86, something that I wanted to read as an assembler or as an assembly reader. So add IW would just be an add. Maybe it'd say add 32 if I wanted, or add W, add 32. But the immediate was obvious because it took an immediate value for the last argument. Or it took a register if I was doing an add two registers to another one. And I just used I'm, an add op. I have a question. Uh, would you, uh, would your function, like let's say you have an add function, and uh, would you be able to put a, a, a constant value into a yeah. Into the into the source register, like let's say you and want to add two to... register together. Let me go throw up the thing here. Go to the docs, see if I can do something here. I started to do something here. So somewhere in the world, I'm writing code. I have a I have a C code wrapper. It's got a macro assembler where where pound define is my assembler something to make my my life easier to write. And then, you know, uh, uh, add and racks comma R R C X comma thirty two would be an instruction, and you know it'd be add R C X plus thirty two, you know, into R I X right. So you'd get that kind of thing. And your example here was if config dot cpu dot x x x is equal to whatever whatever flavor, I don't care what, you know, uh, you know, arm, I don't care. Then you might have conditional ops where you'd say, you know, conditional, I'm going to do add RSP comma RSP comma 32. I'm pushing a frame else. I did something different, right? So this is your conditional emission of code. Right. And you could, you know, force alignment on things or pad or whatever for getting ads there. Um, the things that were generic registers, but I wanted another name as I would use registers, the same name there. And I would say, what was your example? Whatever, um, X. And here, if I wanted to name the register, I would do it this way. And if I wanted to uh, uh, let the system allocate for me, I would say something like new register and leave it alone. And that meant, go pick one that was known to be available and he wouldn't try to spill. If he just couldn't find a register, you get a compile error, right? He had to find one. 
but now I have another register and I can just do my things with it. And so, you know, store four at RSP at an offset of 16 of X, and he would do it. He would know that he was going to do a four byte store into the stack at offset 16 of whatever register X was. Um, jumps were the assembly version of jumps, jump not equal to label comma uh, uh, X. Right. And then somewhere in the world that I had to have a label or I would get an error. Error, you know, so I got a label. Um, I said label here, but I actually had a string on it. And that was the label name. Um, you know, loop in was my label name. So somewhere in the world I said, oh, yeah, loop in is here. And, and then, you know, post loop stuff here, you know, post loop here, whatever. Stuff like that was going on. So you might actually have a, a label here for the loop. And then somewhere in the body of the code here would be, you know, jump not equal loop comma X. And then in here somewhere I said, oh yeah, decrement, decrement X. And then I did something else in the loop here, blah, 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 whatever. Load four of, or how about, you know, in Intel, I would I'd have addressing modes. So add four sum from, yeah, addressing um, modes in general, like uh, um, especially for this, this is stuff that I was trying to do. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm mostly emitting currently like risk five assembly and, and like addressing and instruction formats are super, 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 super simple. And right. On x86, it's uh, yeah. yeah. So we had a couple couple versions where you would write an addressing mode as an explicit addressing mode. Hey, it's an addressing mode. And it has an RSP and as an X and as a scale. So it would do base plus X scaled by shift by two, right? Right. Um, and then we sometimes got rid of the address and just had overloaded, you know, instructions to go take all the different bits for the different kind of addressing modes. And sometimes we had the addressing modes separate because depending on how the garbage collected selected things at the moment or the architecture you're on, you had this kind of addressing mode or that kind of addressing mode. And so you wanted to have a generic addressing mode that varied on different instructions, depending on whatever. So sometimes you had addressing mode and sometimes you just exploded the, the registers out or whatever, the arguments out into the add four there. He would know that it meant, oh, I'm an x86. I have this fancy extra arg register addressing mode. So yeah, that was kind of the flavor of what things looked like. And uh, if you go look at the hotspot, you'll see a lot more of the conditional compilation, but you'll find chunks of code that are bigger or smaller that say things like the underscore underscore and then whatever assembly language du jour. Should I demo my solution to this particular problem or? Um, yeah, we have problems with your demos running long. <laughs> what? No, you cut them short all the time. I know, that's the problem. <laughs> I cut like, them short because okay, they're going long. How long did Adrian demo? Like it was a good fifteen minutes at least. Like so, <laughs> I can um, I can join from the other computer. Like I never had a fifteen minute demo. Like oh, yeah. you have? Oh no, oh, <laughs> I've cut you off well past fifteen <laughs> minutes before, and had to cut you hard off, and that's not a thing that I want to keep having to do. So okay. <laughs> so we need we need to sort that one out. Sure. So, yeah, so I'm Onet, gonna... Onet, something sure. to think about is sometimes when you're presenting, you know, mm -hmm. what you're showing is interesting, but you talk so fast that no one else can ask a question while you're talking. So like oh. when you make it interactive, 15 minutes feels like 30 seconds. If you're mm -hmm. going without taking a breath, 15 minutes feels like four hours. So, you know, learn to learn to um, make it kind of a group conversation and then then it gets a lot more fun for everyone. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, um, we're all we, can, we can have a conversation about it for sure. I just keep like, you know, getting carried away. Sorry for interrupting you as well. But go ahead. <laughs> and that's I'm trying to join. Yeah, that's that's me. Um, so I'm going to. All right. So to, to keep things under control, oh, if okay. I can't. I can't so. I if I can't keep you uh, on track, I'm going to mute you pretty hard and uh, and let people ask questions.
because a common theme you have here is you don't have a common lingo with what we have, what we're thinking about when we talk compilers. And so you open up with statements that don't have any backing, and then you carry from there forward from there. And because they don't have any backing, we don't know where you're starting from, so the follow-on makes no sense. Okay, and that's a okay. place where somebody should interrupt and ask. Okay. So we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to to keep it a little more, uh, hopefully, understandable. Yes. So, so um, I can hold on. I'm gonna. Yeah, you got an echo because you're on twice. You need to yes. you need to kill one of yours. Yeah, there you go. And but okay, can I hear so, you from here? Can you talk? No. So first question yes. up. Hang on. Okay. First question up. So okay, Onet. so um okay. Onet, stop. So you presented a very interesting screen. You've never had a good explanation for what's going on in this screen. There's lots of things that aren't standard for people who don't do fourth for sure. But even for people who understand fourth, there's still lots going on here. Why don't you stop for a second and explain, for instance, like what's the columns of blue and in, in, in your, your choices are poor for people videoing. What's the column on the left? What is this? What are these columns of things? So this is the lexicon. So this is the list of words that you can use. This is Java um, docs for fourth. Uh, kind of, I guess, I guess, <laughs> like, you know, there's no documentation, but we could have documentation for each of those words, but yeah, these are just like the idea here is the idea of that word. That's all. Okay. So, and, so I'm going to summarize. This is the list of known, uh, uh, it's the JDK. It's the known functions that you can call upon to go do things. I mean, it's a list of cells you can name it as, like, you know, it's well, so what's a like. cell? So eight bytes per okay, cell. Okay, Onet, back up. What's a cell? Well, a cell is whatever you make of it. It's eight bytes of storage, and you can call a cell, you can load a cell, you can store okay. into a cell, yeah. et cetera, in, et cetera. In the fourth I grew up with, we called it a word, but a cell was yeah. common enough. Word, word is like, you yeah. know. So um, in, if I'm looking at a word that says KB, what would be in that cell? So you mean where, where is on KB the left get highlighted KB in the middle? Oh, of the left. here, here, yeah, yes, okay, it's here. So um, that's like 48C1 E0. So that's just shift left by 10. <laughs> okay, when in, you say it's 48C whatever da da da, are you reading machine code directly out of eight bytes of the cell? Uh, out of why does forty eight C one E D mean shift left by four or eight or ten or anything? Uh, okay. If we like, it's it's supposed to be shift left uh, racks by ten. Uh, yeah. we can like which which uh, multiplies by ten, which means kilobyte is multiply by ten twenty four, which makes sense for a, a name kilobyte. Okay, so you've got the actual machine encoding in the eight bytes. Well, um, the instructions themselves are not eight bytes, they're four bytes. Yes. I use three bytes of that instruction for encoding, like, you know, three bytes of, and as an as a terminator, I use zero byte because like X64 does not even use zero byte that much, so. So, okay, so so to to paraphrase, paraphrase or, or, or whatever, describe here again, the kilobyte cell holds the instructions to do a shift left racks by 10, and yes. that doesn't fit in eight bytes. It's shorter, so you pad it out somehow to indicate well, in, no. end of. It's it's the instruction. Well, the lexicon space is eight bytes per cell. The instructions themselves are four bytes per instruction. Uh, so this is like two instructions here. One of them with like three bytes of inline or something, and one of them with one byte, and then follow with double zeros. But I don't show the zeros because like. I use zero as a terminator. Like okay, so the the two instructions, one is shift left racks by ten. That oh no, it's it's just shift left racks by ten. It's just like concatenation of those two until like two instructions until you see a type of another instruction. So you can have right. So the ten like the zero a is the immediate cliff. Uh, uh, zero a is the immediate. I, I got that. I was trying to figure out how he pads out to eight when he's got five bytes. Well, that's only that's only f oh, I see. Oh, yeah, so yeah, you're I showing a four-byte instruction. Bytes. I don't pad to eight bytes. I mean, I just pad. 
So this is a four byte instruction, one byte is tag and some extra bits, and three bytes is data, whatever you make of the data. It could be a cell reference, like it could be an ID that reference to this cell and then tag says load, for example, then it's a load instruction for that cell. Like, or you could define it, like, so this okay, is so, defined. Uh, so in, in, the, in the cases we're looking here, the, the lexicon on the left, you have some sort of dump on the right of the contents of the particular lexicon cell, but you're not dumping it as an instruction. You're dumping it as just the hex bytes. So there's a typing or there's not a typing. Like how do you interpret KB as instructions as opposed to data? So whenever I define KB, so this is like a definition. So you could define a word like this, you know, um, it means like, okay, this is both definition begin and end. So megabyte ends whenever KB begins. Uh, like the last, if, so you don't have to encode like instruction end, I mean, function end or stuff like that. It's just like whenever the next one begins. And um, sorry, what was the question? Well, I'm trying to. Oh, I'm, what, what do you make of it? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah if, if the. No, um, no, no, hang on. I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding to somebody who watches this video of what it is you've written and accomplished. And it's a yeah. it's sort of a an uber souped up fourth like thing, and yeah. and then you want to go forward from there and go talk about other things like how you write assembly code in in whatever language you're doing, um, but the starting point here is you have a very different language runtime setup, and these are things that I did when I was like fifteen and twenty. And so I kind of half recognize what you're doing, and I'm trying to figure out if there's something useful to pass on to the you know the next Wait, generation. Wait, computers seventy years ago? I know. <laughs> um, you'd be shocked at how early I got my hands on a computer. Um, but that was. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, um... that was a long ass time ago. Well, <laughs> the the thing is, I got for example, what's interesting about this language is I got instant visualization of the stack state. I got two side stack here. So if I say okay, so like, back okay. Up, back up. You said I have some visualization of the stack and I have it here. I don't see it here. Where Where is your stack? Okay. There it is. I, I'm not There's seeing it still. Uh, can you see the... Um... No, okay. Well, your color choices are horrific. Along <laughs> with the, the shader to do monitor. But no, no, it's it's really hard to read. The, so I'm sure it's the, easy the, for you. Uh, it's the so, the green, so the green is your stack there? Yeah, that's why I think he's, I just now noticed it. It's almost yeah. illegible on my screen. Yes. Like you need to increase your font size by yes. double and change your coloring to give a lot more contrast. A lot more uh, I can't change the coloring now, but I can change the um, font. So this is the older version of that of language which is still text-based. I'm going to turn off this and I can adjust the font size here. Let's make it like, I mean, I'm not, I can't make it too big. Otherwise I lose stuff on the screen too, but. This but it's not normal. readable in the video, which means no one watching the video will see any of it. So, so the issue yeah. you have with the small font on a big screen is that no one else can see it. Okay. So maybe this will work better. So uh, there's gonna... also the fact that um, zoom doesn't full it doesn't show the full screen at full resolution. It kind of scales it down. Yes. So that's why I always have to put my fonts up every time I share screen. Yes. Yes. So yeah, that's the problem. Now I don't see the full. <laughs> well, but that's yeah, that, I mean, this is this is our cool. experience. We don't get to see the full either. In addition to sure. not knowing what's going on, we just don't get to see it. That's so, why yeah, I, I always got... ask at the start is so I can see my screen. Cut off, like you know, I got assembly output for example. Um, that's to the right of the screen, but anyway, right, we're, we're back uh, to assembly output. And I, I wanted to see if we can't change the background or the lettering or the, the, the contrast. Is there any hope of getting the contrast changed here? Contrast, no, sorry, <laughs> okay. But co coloring for dark purple to white or white background to make the dark purple better and maybe it'll hurt the yellow. I don't know. Oh, sorry. I, 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 I can't like, you know, do it now. Is that bad? Okay. Uh, the contrast for me is fine. Is it? It's, it's very bad for me. It's yeah. basically, sorry, I, I couldn't I... see your cursor on the stack 
when you were trying to show it. I didn't even know there was. I could make the cursor a little bit better if that's going to help. Like, um, not going to hurt. I mean, I can change the colors too, but it's going to take some like you know iteration. Oh, sh that's the wrong one. Sorry. Uh, so uh, I think the issue is just about like uh, it's daytime in one place, nighttime in the other. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> well, and daytime... you have the shader doing things that are distracting. Um, you know, kind of like it's faking a, an old school IBM monitor, except it's not really. And that's <laughs> that's very not helpful. Oh uh, well, I like it a lot that way. Well, that's fine. And just saying what you like is not necessarily readable to other people, and therefore you have trouble sharing because people can't look at your stuff and actually see so it people physically. People like this font a lot. Like you know, you're you're one of the. Okay, some people like it a lot, some people hate it, but yeah, I'm not going to change the font. Oh, it totally, so it totally totally reminds me of IBM green screen from, you know, 60 years ago. Oh, yeah. Not, not, that's, not necessarily. That's the much. idea. All right, I'm I mean, going to claim idea. that we're that's running right. out of our time. Fine. Um, Is anyone else going to do it, say anything, or can we just be done? Uh, if, if you guys are uh, tired, sure, but I, I do have one thing. Uh, yeah, keep it I short, can... and that's fine. All right, so basically, um, I, I'm writing a single pass compiler, and I was thinking a lot on uh, like about how to um, how to at the same time support multiple backends and multiple whatevers, uh, like maybe an LSP or other things. And the thing is, uh, because everything is interleaved with each other, like I don't have an IR, so like in the parsing code, uh, there's all this code generation, and uh, the thing is, like, if, if I want to support multiple backends and not write multiple compilers, then I kind of need to put branches everywhere. But all of these branches are in hot paths because I'm emitting code quite fast. And that is a bit tricky. So I thought, ah, OK, I can do conditional compilation. And I can have um, like kind of like if devs. So like in, in C, I could maybe is say whatever, if dev, uh, um, I don't know. If, if, I'm, if I'm targeting risk five or something, then I emit this code and other architecture this code. Uh, and then I compile different versions of my compiler uh, with the, the different backends interleaved in it. And then I have, yeah, uh, one compiler for each backend. But that is a bit tricky because I, I do actually want to support compiling to multiple backends in one program. And also to multiple instruction set architectures and stuff. Um, yeah. So you're asking so. how do I not have tests in my middle of my parsing code generation to pick the back end? Yeah, like, yeah, asking. right, right. How how do I get rid of these branches? Because I mean, yeah, yeah. Like uh, branches for me or, some sort of test and branch, yeah. But it's I parse a or, bit, or, put code out a bit. I parse a bit, I put code out a bit. When I put code out, I ask, am I x86 or am I arm or risk? Right, right, and this this uh, the last uh, question there, like uh, which instruction set architecture I, I am think, I this brand? I think you're stuck doing those. And um, the thing is, uh, so so I've been experimenting with like an approach uh, that um, like uh, lets me so 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 imagine um, imagine uh, I have a like I use conditional compilation. What's conditional to... compilation? Ah, so sorry. Like, um, so uh, instead of traditional, like pound if. Yeah, yeah. Pound if uh, risk five, then emit this. Pound if uh, else if this, I emit this. So, so you so make like, you uh, make separate binaries for each target. Yes, yes, separate okay. binaries for each target. Okay. Right. And the thing is, that would be not, that would work if I only if I only need to like call one compiler to compile my program for one architecture, but. My program is supposed to, supposed to be containing code for different architectures, so I need to like somehow not have multiple binaries. Uh, but but basically, what I did, what I'm trying to do is yeah, you don't I, want I, pound I, if you want if. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. So I thought maybe I can. Uh, what I'm currently trying to do is I just compile. I do compile all of these different compilers, uh, like like uh, different binaries, and then uh, inside of one binary, I switch to the like I. Depending on the target, I jump to the um, function of the other uh, binary. You're so, writing cross compilers, 
Is that what I yeah. Heard? Are yeah, you like ever the, are you ever emitting for two different platforms at the same time? Yes, uh, blended platforms like uh, different two different, two different hardware. Architect. Architect. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, I am. So I like, say platform because uh, sometimes you actually have to know the OS to emit the binaries. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, so so basically, what I'm trying to get to work is that uh, once I start parsing an expression, when I when I when I'm starting, like when I know I'm inside of a a code block that requires a different instruction set architecture, I'm jumping to the uh, function in the different binary um, that, that matches this architecture. So I don't have any branch there anymore. Uh, well, you had a branch so, to up to it. I, so I, I only branch at the start, like uh, yeah. basically I define um, whether or not this is like, I define uh, to which target, I compile a function at the top of the function. So I enter the function, and by that point, I know uh, yeah. like how I'm supposed to interpret the rest of the function. So then I jump to 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 this to the correct binary that uh, compiles this function. And in in the, like during this process, like inside of this function, I don't need to do have any checks because uh, like while I'm inside this, this function, I know for sure that I am I have a particular target. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, like, uh, technically, I need this means that my different binaries need to share the same memory and the same data structures, um, which is like super unsafe. Uh, yeah, and I'm figuring out how to best do this. Uh, yeah, but I don't understand why different... they have to share, but I also don't understand why they're super unsafe to share. Well, I'm kind of yeah, but whatever. Uh, uh, it's not some, yeah. The, the, um, it's not so important. Um, yeah. But I, I noticed that uh, like th this approach works with when I want to support different backends, but um, there are some problems when I want to maybe support, uh, like maybe reuse my compiler for an LSP because uh, yeah, that, that's also not so trivial because um, LSPs have different data structures and they focus on different things. But yeah. in my current one pass compiler, I discard a lot of information. Yeah, right. And, I, uh, I would think that would be tough there. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I use an LSP. Reuse, my, uh, sorry. Uh, I use an L, I use mine as an LSP, and I keep the information around. But whatever, it's fine. Well, this yeah. sounds like a, a thing that would be good to spend a little time and organize your thoughts, and whether you present them at CCC or not, the act of trying to organize to present to somebody often clears your head on what it is you're doing and how you're you're. What I'm you're very, stuck on. I'm very curious why it's a one pass compiler. Uh, purely, I mean, like uh, compilation speed is one of the features I, I, I'm aiming at. And yeah, also, compilation yeah. speed for one pass compiler, unless you're producing the world's shittiest code, it's going to be slower. Yeah, it's it's fine. I mean, I care about uh, first debug speed, like uh, debug, sorry, debug compilation speed and type checking and uh, like, yeah, just like having minimal latency. So if I have a, I don't know, 100 million line code base or 10 million lines of code base, if I edit something, I want to have, have an a instant result. you have a 10 million line code base? Many people do. I don't right now. <laughs> I, I do have, I, I am working on a 1 million line of code, code base. Okay, and, but uh, is that code base written in the language your compiler is compiling? Uh, no, no. Okay. So then you don't have a million lines you're going to throw out your compiler. Uh, I mean, I, no, I have, a, I have a generator program that, that tests it. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, of course, that will take some time until I get there. But uh, just um, I, I do think thinking about this problem uh, is, is very important for a language to scale to such a, like, to such a line count. Because, yeah, I don't know. That, Rust doesn't like do a, it for me. Like a different, different set of things there. Usually, by the time you get to like the 10 million line code, you're actually doing separate compilation. And you don't have to do all 10 million lines every time you edit any little thing. And yeah, that's, that's well, it depends. I mean, uh, it really depends on the dependency graph and what things you're editing. A lot so of times when you're changing, like, is, very cool. Yeah, sorry. Is it a new project you're doing or is this a long existing one? No, I mean, new, I guess uh, it was be shortly before I joined CCC, I started doing like working on it. Uh, I didn't realize that what you were doing was single pass. Yeah, it, I, I, I did. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. 
Which, what? No, I did uh, I did my change my mind a few times about this. Like first I didn't start out with it, but then I I I I figured it's an interesting experiment because one pack compilers. I mean, um, I would just like to see how with using modern language and um, maybe some interesting generic programming, how I could I don't know structure such a one pass compiler to make it like actually scale. Uh, and yeah, I was I was curious. I mean, if it turns out to be a failed experiment, um, then I'll just discard everything. I don't mind. Uh, but I do like I have I have I, I do have um, a, a big focus on creating verticals like demos. Um, like I, while I'm working on this compiler, I'm also writing an operating system. So I'll be like, developing them both hand in hand. And if I notice that um, like the things are getting like not pra practical enough, then yeah. Uh, I, I can find a new hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like you, you've bought yourself some amount of trouble. I did several one pass compilers, but only ever targeting a single target, generally x86, not trying to repeat different targets. And it's not, you know, if you're, if you're worried about speed, if you don't toss out of L1 or L2 before you go to the second pass, you're not going to lose very much. If you if you compile some chunk of it to L1 or maybe to L2 at best, you keep it pretty tight. And then you go as pass one, and then you pass two while selling L2, it's going to be blazing fast. You will surely have more issues with memory bandwidth or latency to memory to haul 10 million lines through than you actually have compile time issues. Yeah, I mean, actually, I did mention that in Discord. I, I do have my doubts about it, though, because uh, like... Like memory bandwidth limited, I'm not sure because I mean yeah. and you won't uh, be bandwidth limited, you'll be throughput or latency limited. Yeah, that's, city, I guess how that, fast can you shove bytes through the memory hierarchy? Uh, uh, on a single core on like a computer, yeah. you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, You're uh, gonna shove things through on a single core, and when it arrives at the CPU, how many cycles are you gonna be able to get for you to get the next cache line of source code in? And if you really want to do 10 million lines, yeah, you could get, you, you can imagine not having too many cycles per byte. But if you're just doing somebody's, you know, 10,000 whatevers, they're all going to be sitting in your cache anyhow. 10,000 lines of this would be in your L2. Yeah, Adrian, what I'd really love to trick you into doing huh. is instead of sure. writing the world's fastest one pass compiler that uses one core on a 64 core chip, why don't you think about how to use a couple hundred cores to compile in parallel because uh, even then if you're hitting a memory bandwidth you're still you're not you know with 100 cores each running at two percent you're still faster than that single pass compiler on one core i mean it's a good point i i, I do think uh and that, it's a bit and curious, that but... by the way you know that's an unsolved problem because i'd love to see i'd love to steal i mean i'd love to see your ideas there they uh, my run father that doesn't compile threads in parallel. Mine works. I think, uh, I, think I think it's it's. Oh, sorry. No, go finish ahead. up and then 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 leave. I'll go and then I still want to wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. No. I, I just think uh, I, I would like to. For me, the order of optimization is important. I, I think like reaching towards reaching to multi-threading when there's so many low-hanging fruits. Uh, Parallel like a, is is a super low hanging fruit, right? Uh, well, that's yeah, yeah what... but I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. But by the way, another thing is also like this one pass compiler allows me to have no IR, uh, so yeah, like, that gives me that does give me good like decent benefits as well. Like, yeah, it, it, um, forces... it does make the code actually really simple. Uh, so yeah. that that's. Uh, sorry, I'm but, just agreeing. yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm not a compiler engineer technically, so. No, no. Uh, wait, uh, sorry, no, my, my internet is a bit. Wait, wait, uh, wait. Basically, I'm not. A... Yeah, no, 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 no. There's no, there's no coursework or official, you know, policy or or path that says you are or not a compiler engineer. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a, if you're working on a compiler, you're a compiler engineer. I'm an IDE uh, engineer. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should say experienced because, like, yeah. Uh, I am trying out things that maybe look a bit uh, silly or naive or something, but uh, well, you I, your experience now. Yeah, I mean, it speaks to me. I guess that's that's what I feel like. Uh, just mm -hmm. yeah, this approach 
speaks to me in the same way I think also about how I'm working well, in my operating system. But yeah. uh, this is right. this is I mean other people at own that in particular has this thing speaks to him and then he goes hog wild with it and he's making progress he's learning things and he's doing stuff I think that's cool. Yeah, if I have this at some point in a form where I can present something with more cohesion and like uh, something that looks nice, then yeah. The the step to go go make it presentable forces you to get a cohesion that often leads to the next breakthrough in your head about what to do. It's worth it. Yeah, either breakthrough or existential crisis because you realize the thing. <laughs> well, okay, that happens work. too. <laughs> but, which is fine, right? They fail fast, I guess. Uh all right. Leave what you want to always, add. Always reserve like three months for bug fixes because, wow, there's a lot of bug fixing I had to do once I decided I want to release, uh, get it better out. I find that writing bugs is a waste of time because then you have to fix them later. So I just don't waste the time writing them. Excellent. Good to know. I've got a question. Like, um, do you think that fort is ever going to be popular? Again? No. Sure. no, 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 like sorry. fort like. I mean, you think like my people would program in my language, or is that like a absolutely like you know, I'll find okay, three. yeah. Let, let me let me add the the one place I think fourth lives on, and alternatives that are very fourth like might continue to live on, and that's in the very smallest embedded chips coming up for the first few times. That the, the fourth is a useful thing for an embedded engineer to get his chip up and set up to talk to the damn serial port so we can hook up to a monitor and get to, you know, get to a real debugger and, and download code that came out of LLVM. But the first time when he's trying to come up, yeah, maybe he's using a fourth like thing. And I've seen that happen on and off for years. It's a go to grab for the very smallest yeah. chips. Bootstrapping a compiler on a small chip. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. in the long run, do I think there'll be lots of people using your language? No, I do not. Do I think there is no market for it? No, the world's a big place. I can't say no one ever. Um, yeah. Well, 90% of just... people are going to be writing build in. So look that. There you go. And then you can have confidence. And that's the other good answer. <laughs> the thing about like making a language for yourself and like making a language for others is like, the uh, amount of effort you put in is tremendous. And um, I figured out how to do things like version control, how to do things like, like you know, the Z editor, what Z editor is doing. Like, um, I was going to have those things already, like, you know, with. Yeah, like, just, just let it, I mean, decide what you want to do with what you're doing. But I wouldn't put too much hopes you're going to be able to share with yeah. an excited audience. But you might be able to share ideas that other people pull something useful out of and walk away with that they take it and go go run do something else but i don't know that what you've set up for yourself is necessarily going to appeal to very many people can't say that yeah i mean it's a very personal language and um it's it's quite minimal like even though it does not seem like minimal all right if you understood it. but let, own it yeah let's let it go because I'm going to be over time. My wife just got back and I want to go have lunch and talk That's to true. her. And do uh, last things. word, uh, Cameron, I do have my compiler running on multiple cores. Uh, I have I one. Know. I have one problem where I accidentally had a realloc and I didn't implement a realloc working across threads. So I just have to do one more Memory implementation. Safety. Totally. Okay. That's, that's not my compiler. That's my language. But yes, my language right. does really need that. All right. So the, the, right. the challenge yeah. I have, the challenge I have for for you and Adrian is this: when you have interconnected pieces, how do you how do you effectively parallelize them? Kind of like almost almost like you can imagine a work list of a hundred thousand items. How do you spread that over, say, a hundred cores, such that when each piece is ready to go, it can go and then kind of event drive or work list drive the the rest of them to continue, right? And then how do you do that in a way that your builds are repeatable? Anyway, it's a problem I've been thinking about for years and have ideas, but no solutions. Can, can you write that continue. down in text? Because uh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> to be continued. Save it, for, yeah. save it for next week. 
I too have been worked on very similar problem, both with compilers and without on that particular topic. That's a good one for next week. Sounds good. I end it here because we are time out. Cheers. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.